This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Hey, good evening, and welcome again to the Geography of U.S. Presidential Elections. Uh, welcome to those who are viewing and listening to this course on uh, iTunes University. Today, we're going to finish most of the historical overview. Uh, we ended at the Civil War, so we'll pick up the story there. And I hope to take it up to the Carter, perhaps uh, Reagan uh, era, so a long sweep of history. Before I begin the historical narrative, I'd just like to sum up some of the geographical patterns that we see in this long period. The basic pattern is pretty simple, and it's inherited from the Civil War period. We see a far north dominated by the Republican Party, a south dominated by the Democratic Party, and an important series of swing states in the middle, going from Connecticut through New York and New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And those states would decide the elections in most cases. As the country fills out and adds the western parts, we find that the Pacific Coast usually going with the Northeast, with the Republican Party, and we find what we might call the interior west, a region from the Great Plains through the Rocky Mountains, as a very important swing region that in some elections would align with the South and the Democrats uh, in important uh, elections like uh, 1896, 1916, and then at other times it would align itself with the Republicans in the Northeast uh, and swing the elections in their directions. That's a pattern that starts to break down in the Great Depression but then reestablishes itself uh, in the 1950s but then about 1960, it all breaks down, and we enter a period of tremendous fluctuations. Uh, for example, you'll see the maps later on. If you look at the Northeast, New York and New England, you'll find that in 1956, it voted almost entirely for the Republican candidate, Dwight Eisenhower, only. Uh, New York City and Boston really went for the Democrat, Adlai Stevenson. But then eight years later, 1964, we find the total reverse, this region entirely uh, with just a few exceptions in the camp of the uh, Democrats, uh, Lyndon Johnson. But then, lo and behold, uh, fast forward again to 1972, it switches back to the Republicans. And today, it's uh, at least New England, uh, certainly very clearly in the Democratic camp, at least as far as presidential elections go. So we, we have seen this recent period of fluctuation of instability, and it remains to be seen whether we're going to move into a more stable period of geographical alignments which is one of the most interesting uh, issues. So I will go back. Uh, again, this is a map I showed you before, looking at the uh, period right before the Civil War and just noting how strong the Republicans are in the North, but nowhere else. No support, uh, certainly in the South, uh, and not much support even in places like Southern Illinois. The Republicans, of course, are the victorious party after the end of the Civil War, but they face a real challenge. How are they going to maintain power when they have such a limited geographical base? Yes, this is the area of, of, of large cities and uh, urbanization, but it's really not enough to have a firm base of power. Uh, so the Republicans in uh, 1868 come up with several strategies in order to maintain power. One is to do everything they can to enfranchise the former slaves, the blacks in the southern part of the United States, to use federal troops uh, uh, which was certainly necessary to keep uh, slaves, former slaves, I should say, uh, able to vote. So that was uh, one main strategy. Uh, another strategy was to do what the uh, Whigs had done uh, at many times, which was to find a popular general to run. In this case, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, the most uh, successful general of the Civil War. Uh, and finally, the third was to whatever they could associate the Democrats with rebellion, uh, waving the bloody shirt, as it was called, bringing up uh, what had been done uh, during the Civil War. Uh, so as you can see, in 1868, it was a successful strategy. You can see the Republicans winning many southern states, but they did so largely through the votes of the, of the freed uh, former slaves. Uh, uh, you can also see several states which were not uh, yet through Reconstruction and were not able to vote. So a pretty clear win. Note, though, that they were not winning uh, all of the North at this time, and that was largely because of the New York City area uh, and the sort of um, um, coastal zone here in the, in the Mid-Atlantic states. 
Ulysses S. Grant did not have a very successful administration. He was a man who actually had no presidential aspirations. I mean, the story was, he was asked what he wanted. He said, well, I'd like to be the mayor of uh, Galena, maybe build a sidewalk to my home. Uh, but he was recruited and uh, did his duty, uh, if you will. And recruit, when he became president, brought in a lot of his friends and cronies, many of whom turned out to be very corrupt. And the Grant administration in general was noted for its corruption, and the, the reconstruction effort in the South became very well known for high levels of corruption and problems. So that led then in 1872, uh, the next election, to a revolt among the Republicans. So here's this new party, about 18 years old, remarkably successful, and it's already falling apart the revolt of the so-called liberal Republicans, who were most of the and intellectual leaders of the movement. They wanted nothing to do with Grant and his corrupt regime. So they separated out, formed their own party, had a convention, uh, and ended up, uh, ended up nominating an unlikely uh, character, Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune. Well known, you probably know his, his famous saying, go west, young man. They say Greeley was, was a an individual who was enthusiastic about every new idea that came down the road. There wasn't an ism that he didn't like. He was especially attracted to utopianism, and he had toyed with vegetarianism and socialism. He had hired Karl Marx for, to write for his uh, newspaper. Uh, but at this time, he was getting a bit old and uh, maybe a little bit wobbly. Uh, at any rate, his campaign was not very uh, successful. And one of the things that Greeley did was, well, first of all, was to unite with the Democrats. The Democrats just wanted to beat Grant. And they figured the only way they could win is to join with him, even though Greeley had been a total devastating critic of the Democratic Party earlier. So this is an, an odd combination. Uh, and Greeley also uh, was proposing lightening up on Reconstruction, basically letting white Southerners have more leeway. That led to some very uh, bitter political cartoons. Uh, here is Greeley shaking hands with a former rebel with a pistol in his hand who has just shot a number of freedmen in the South, uh, giving you an idea of the, um, uh, the tenor of the, of the election. Well, it didn't work out well for Greeley. He was a disaster as a campaigner. Uh, as soon as the election was over, he... Uh, uh, he got committed to a, a mental hospital shortly thereafter, and then uh, died before the Electoral College met. He still got some votes, though, even though he was dead uh, in the Electoral <laughs> College. Uh, so this gave Ulysses S. Grant uh, um, another term and a certain amount of uh, power uh, and influence. Certainly, the Democrats were very eager uh, to defeat him, uh, in the next election. They were aided by a financial panic that happened in 1873. This was actually an international uh, financial panic. Here's an uh, uh, image of a bank run at the time. Uh, that led the Democrats to regain the House of Representatives. And it led to one of the most interesting and problematic elections in U.S. history. Uh, which is the election of 1876. The Republicans choose a somewhat dull uh, attorney, Rutherford B. Hayes, and the Democrats go for quite the opposite, Samuel Tilden, an extremely wealthy man who became a district attorney and was a crusader against corruption. Samuel Tilden was uh, famous as the man who sent Boss Tweed of uh, the famous uh, Tammany Ring in New York City to prison. So he was a reformer, a uh, New Yorker, and uh, looked like the Democrats were going to be able to come back and win. The Republicans were running scared. And if you look at the election returns, you can see something very interesting. You can see Samuel Tilden in the popular uh, uh, vote getting 51%. So he certainly uh, won when it came to actual votes. But the Electoral College was uncertain. And the uncertainty had to do with three southern states that were still occupied by federal troops as part of Reconstruction. The returns were uncertain. They were contested. Actually, there was an Oregon uh, electoral vote that was contested as well. It goes into Congress. And basically, a compromise is hashed out. And the compromise 
is that, uh, that Hayes is going to become president. Afterwards, Wags called him Rutherford B. Hayes. And in return, the Republicans would end the regime of Reconstruction, pull out of the South, and basically let the Southern white establishment rule in the South again. That began the process of disenfranchisement of African Americans in the South. Didn't happen everywhere immediately. It was a gradual process. But by 1900, blacks in the South were, by and large, not voting at all. And you had the creation of the uh, segregation, Jim Crow, uh, and so on. So you can really find a lot of the roots of that back at this uh, contested uh, election. One of the uh, most noted authors of this time was Mark Twain. And one of his books was called The Gilded Age. And this period of American history from the 1870s, 80s, uh, into the 1890s is often called, after Twain's book, The Gilded Age. Uh, you can uh, read it for free, as you can uh, see on the, the images uh, up there. It's in the public domain now. And uh, often uh, historians look at the politics of this period, the period especially uh, after, after the Hayes-Tilden election. And they, call, they refer to it as uh, Gilded Age politics. It really lasts into the, into the 1890s. And it's characterized by a few things. One is very close elections between the Democrats and the Republicans. Knife edge elections, very evenly divided electorate. Not all that much difference between the parties. By this time, they are both essentially conservative parties, certainly by the standards of today, but even by the standards of the time. Whereas you remember when the Republicans uh, began, they were often considered a, a radical party with a lot of ideas that we would today associate with the left of the uh, political spectrum. But by the Gilded Age, most of those ideas were uh, in abatement. Certainly were not at the uh, front burner. And the Democratic Party strongly associated with the South, with cultural conservatism uh, as well. It doesn't mean there were no differences. The Democrats tended to be the party of small government. The Republicans were the party of a more active government. The Democrats wanted low tariffs. They wanted free trade. The Republicans wanted high, much higher tariffs. They wanted to protect US industry. And they got a lot of money from industrialists because of that. Uh, the Democrats pushed states' rights. The Republicans uh, were more in favor of federal power. And like I say, the, in many elections, the actual platforms of the party uh, um, didn't have that much difference between them. But there were some underlying differences, which is quite the opposite of what today we would more often associate with the Democrats uh, and the Republicans. So not only have the um, geographical bases of those parties changed, to some extent, not fully by any means, but to some extent, the ideologies have uh, as well. You found uh, major tensions, though, within the parties. To some extent, uh, some of these tensions within the parties were more extreme. Not so much geographical uh, as ideological. Uh, it's interesting the terms they use. The Republicans in the Gilded Age were divided between the stalwarts and the half-breeds. The stalwarts were those who basically wanted to continue with the policies of the Grant administration. Uh, they were generally in favor of what we today might consider machine politics. Uh, the half-breeds were the reformers. They were dead set against any sort of uh, shady practices. They wanted to clean house. Uh, and they battled uh, epic battles against the, uh, the half-breeds. The Democrats were divided, too. And we don't have uh, a, a nice pairing of terms uh, for that, but we could generally uh, come up with sort of two um, different tendencies. Uh, we talk, might talk about the more uh, traditional Democrats versus the group that are often called the Bourbon Democrats uh, in reference both to the alcoholic drink and to the Bourbon dynasty in France. The Bourbon Democrats were associated um, much more with financial interests. They were actually very close uh, to Wall Street. Uh, so they had a strong, not so much industrial bent as they did a financial bent. Uh, they were the proponents of what is sometimes today called classical liberalism. We might call it today a sort of moderate libertarianism. Again, laissez-faire, small government, uh, not much uh, government 
interference in, in uh, moral life, uh, if you will. And their opponents, the more traditional Democrats, tended to be much more populist and be very suspicious of the banks, uh, especially suspicious of the, the railroads and were conservative in a more uh, social sense. So those are the big splits within both these parties which are going on uh, throughout this period. Next election I'll bring up is uh, 1880. At this time, the Democrats decide to take a play out of the Republicans' book and nominate a popular former uh, general, uh, Winifield Scott Hancock, uh, six foot four, dashing, a man who had been uh, very prominent at the Battle of Gettysburg and other uh, uh, battles. So here is the, the Democratic Party, the party of the South, often tarred with rebellion. Very clever strategy to get a, a northern general uh, and uh, nominate him. The Republicans go for uh, James Garfield, Boatman Jim, he was called. He's from this Western Reserve area of Ohio that we've talked about before. Very Republican-oriented uh, uh, part. Of the state, Garfield was a reformer, so he was part of the, the half-breed movement. But as today, you need to balance the party, or excuse me, balance the ticket. Uh, so a man named Chester A. Arthur, who was a half-breed, was chosen to be his vice president. Uh, Arthur was part, uh, uh, yes, um, uh, from New York, often considered to have been, um, uh, had some shady connections with, uh, or, some organized uh, politics uh, in that part of the country. As you can see, the election here on the state level pretty much entirely split on north-south lines. We do have New Jersey, which was an important swing state in that period, going for the Democrats, but otherwise, we also have California going for the Democrats, which was unusual in those days. So it's actually a very close election. Actually, the electors were split to some extent but we really see this north-south division uh, at the time. Uh, but again, very close popular vote, 48.3, 48.2%. Uh, so just these knife edge elections has characterized this period. What happened to Garfield? He was in office not very long and was assassinated, was shot, was shot by a frustrated office seeker, which brought up the issue of corruption. The issue that sometimes called the spoil system, uh, which, again, closely associated with the Grant administration, but a system where those who supported the party would end up getting, uh, if they wanted, government jobs. Often in the post office, you know, the U.S. government, federal government was not very large at this time, but it did have some positions, sinecures that it could grant, and people often uh, became highly involved in politics because they wanted those sorts of positions. And this really brought to the fore the need for civil service reform. And again, Mark Twain was vehement on this subject, writing about how can we hire people to run our government departments and serve in our foreign embassies abroad who have no skills in this area, who are chosen strictly on political grounds. So that became a, a real focus, and it was a real focus in the next election, uh, pitting James G. Blaine of Maine uh, and, uh, and Grover Cleveland, also of uh, New York, a uh, Republican. Blaine had been the real leader of the half-breeds of the reformers, but he was not spotless himself. There was some evidence that he had been involved in some shady deals with a railroad in Arkansas. Uh, certainly that's what the Democrats ac accused him of, and they would uh, chant, as I said before, uh, Blaine, Blaine, James... G. Blaine, continental liar from the state of Maine. Uh, Grover Cleveland, on the other hand, was a man of, um, of spotless uh, public integrity, but his private life was, by the standards of the time, marred because he had, uh, was paying for child support for a, uh, a, ch a child uh, born of a woman to whom he was not married. So at the time, that was a, a, a big issue. Uh, Democrats tended to call him Grover the Good, and Republicans sometimes called him the Beast from Buffalo. So you can get an idea <laughs> of the uh, intensity uh, of, of the time. Uh, it was an interesting election. For one thing, there were a group of prominent Republicans who left the party. These were the so-called mugwumps. And that comes from an, an, an Algonquian Indian word. It uh, was used, originally used uh, as a pejorative but it was uh, adopted by the Mugwumps. Mark Twain was one of their leaders. Uh, Charles Francis Adams was uh, one. There were a number. 
very prominent uh, intellectual elite of the Republicans who, again, were upset with the party. Blaine may have been a, a, a half-breed reformer, but he, it, it wasn't clear that he was completely honest in his dealings with the railroads. And the mugwumps wanted, above all else, good government and to get rid of any sort of taint uh, of corruption. It was another, another very, very close election. And it may well have been decided in New York City by the large Irish population of the city when Samuel Burchard, a Presbyterian minister, said at a Blaine rally in New York City, we are Republicans and don't propose to leave our party, and remember other Republicans had been leaving it, to leave our party and identify ourselves with the party whose antecedents have been rum, Romanism, and rebellion. So in other words, Catholicism, uh, alcoholic consumption, remember the, uh, the Bourbon Democrats particularly were soft on issues like alcohol, where the Republican Party at this time had a very, very strong prohibitionist a streak within it, and of course rebellion going back to the Civil War. This was enough to tip the scales among the Irish population in New York. Uh, Blaine lost New York City by a few thousand, uh, excuse me, lost New York State by a few thousand votes, and that's, and by doing so, lost the election. So you can see how a very, very small slip uh, could perhaps throw the election uh, one way or the, uh, the other. And when you have these kind of knife edge uh, voting tallies, then, yeah, no surprise that that sort of thing could happen. Uh, so 1884, uh, here's just the, uh, the votes. You can see New York going to Cleveland. Almost all the counties in upstate New York uh, voted for Blaine, but there was uh, enough of a Cleveland vote uh, here. And I should mention, too, Cleveland was the quintessential Bourbon Democrat very closely associated with Wall Street interests and associated particularly with a hard money standard. He was the great proponent of moving to the gold standard. The U.S. had had what was called a bimetal system of both, with the dollar base both on gold and on silver, but the U.S. was moving towards the gold standard at this time. Uh, Britain had moved to the gold standard. The global economic system was moving to the uh, gold standard. Uh, and Wall Street uh, bankers and others certainly wanted this. They wanted the solidity of gold, of, of, uh, of hard money at this time. And Grover Cleveland was, in, uh, in, in that, uh, that sense, their man. Next election, 18, uh, 1888, Grover Cleveland running again. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, his opponent. And the big issue was tariff reform. So Cleveland had been president, but he was not able to push through tariff reform. As a Democrat, especially a Bourbon Democrat at this time, he wanted low tariffs, and tariffs were very high at this time, often 40% on manufactured goods, sometimes even higher. Uh, low tariffs were something that farmers wanted uh, in the West, Southerners wanted, and industrialists uh, did not want. And actually, the uh, new labor movement at this time was not happy about tariff reduction either, because they uh, fear that there'd be more competition from abroad and that they could potentially uh, lose their jobs. Uh, that was the uh, big issue. And the Republicans figured out how to exploit it and how to exploit it in the same place where they had lost the previous election, the Irish of New York City. How to exploit this? Well, where did you find the big support in the world for free trade? From Britain. Absolutely. So the British were pushing free trade. The Irish, not exactly pro-British, right? So you could link the two. And there was a famous, um, actually, um, a phony letter at this time, the so-called Murchison Letter, which was written to the British ambassador, uh, Lionel Sackville West, uh, from a man uh, posing as another person, a Republican, asking who to vote for. And the British ambassador says, well, of course you want to vote for Cleveland, who uh, has these pro-British policies that was circulated in the Irish community in New York. And again, some uh, historians look at that and say that could well have been enough. Because uh, here we are again, uh, 1888, and we are back to uh, the divide. You can see, again, some northern states, Connecticut and New Jersey, but New York with its very important, you can see 36 electoral votes 
definitely more than any other state, going in the Republican camp, losing it uh, uh, for the Democrats. And once the Republicans got in, they pushed tariffs up to the highest level they had yet been. So a victory uh, for the Democrats, uh, excuse me, for the Republicans at this time. During this period, again, Gilded Age, we could say, one of the most interesting divisions has to do with religiosity and voting pattern. So we're basically looking at the, the, the late 1800s up to uh, 1896. Everything changes in 1896. But up till then, looking at the percent Republican GOP vote uh, in the US North and Midwest, looking at different religious groups, and we can see the Irish Catholics being the most Democratic voting group, only 20% Republican voting. Uh, other uh, Catholic groups, uh, Italian Catholics, German Catholics, not quite as Democratic, but definitely on the Democratic side of things. Uh, interesting, uh, confessional German Lutherans. Uh, back up a little bit, the, the big division that the historians are pointing out here is between the pietistic Republicans versus the liturgical Democrats. Interesting division. By pietistic, we mean religious faiths that emphasize personal piety, of uh, a, a deep sense that the individual has to be highly engaged in, uh, in the movement of faith, that the individual has to uh, move into, um, create for him or herself a, a very moral position. Uh, they tend to be abol uh, excuse me, uh, um, prohibitionists against uh, alcohol and pushing a, a sort of a very firm moral standards. The liturgical uh, groups, Catholics, German Lutherans, more of a focus on going through the religious ceremonies, uh, experience going through mass, much less of a focus on sort of individuality in that sense, much less focus on what were the, uh, sometimes called moral issues of uh, alcohol drinking. And actually, alcohol is really key here, especially for the German groups. Uh, very, very important issue. The Republicans at this time were the party of prohibition, pushing it very hard. And that's something that pushed the Demo tended to push the Democrats into the, excuse me, the Germans into the Democratic group. It's interesting, Episcopalians, often associated as the, the religion of the upper crust of the elite, but it's definitely in the liturgical camp here, and the Episcopalians pretty much split. Uh, then we start going down to Methodist, Baptist, Swedish Lutherans, and Norwegian Lutherans are actually a little bit more Republican. You can see Methodist, 75% Republican, Baptist, 80. Swedish Lutherans, 85. Norwegian Lutherans up to 90, and Quakers at 95%. How do you think that would be today with a group like the Society of Friends, the Quakers? I don't think you're going to find many Republican uh, voting Quakers. Uh, and again, actually, a lot of these have switched. We look at, we'll look at this later on areas heavily settled by Swedish and Norwegian Lutherans. Today, uh, at least in some states, tend to, these tend to be more Democratic voting areas. So uh, many, many issues we've seen these, these, these very, very uh, interesting uh, reversals. I'll show you a few ethnic maps here, and I'm sorry, I don't have the county level maps to compare them to. They're just not available for me to show them to you. If you go to uh, the, um, some, some of the books on the list that uh, actually will give you the county level uh, data, you can, you can um, make some comparisons here. So this is shows Norwegian ancestry today. It's not showing it at this period, but you can see in Wisconsin, for example, very heavy Norwegian zone in the western part of the state. Back in the Gilded Age, that was the Republican uh, vote, the most strongly Republican voting part of Wisconsin. Uh, whereas the west, excuse me, the eastern part of Wisconsin, as we'll see later, much more Democratic uh, voting and much more German. A real sort of uh, split there between the, the German and more Scandinavian settled part of a state like Wisconsin. Uh, Swedish uh, areas, so you can see Swedish settled zones. Interesting, today a lot of these areas show up as pretty strongly democratic, particularly northern uh, Minnesota, but even these counties here in Illinois along the uh, Mississippi River. Uh, but back in the Gilded Age, these were strongly Republican uh, voting zones. Strong, uh, both of these Swedish and Norwegian areas were big supporters of prohibition, 
Prohibition Party did better up in this area than in any other part of the country uh, when it was a, uh, a force. And then we can compare it to uh, German-speaking areas. And here you can see in Wisconsin, uh, definitely in the eastern part of the state, that was, in the Gilded Age, the Democratic voting part. Now, now it's completely reversed. Now it's this part of eastern Wisconsin that's more Republican and the West is more Democratic voting. So I, I find that a, a pretty uh, interesting split. But as German population grew up, actually Wisconsin in, in 1892 voted for the Democratic Party, which was a total change. It had been solidly Republican, but as the German population uh, built up, uh, the state did indeed in that year go for the, for the, uh, for the Democrats. And it, it's, I lived in Madison, Wisconsin for a year and I had a very interesting experience in a small town not too far from Madison walking around and a friend nudged me in the ribs and he said, count the businesses in this little town. How many of them are bars or taverns? And we did. We counted them up and it was about 40%. And there, so there is still a real sort of German-derived uh, culture of, uh, of taverns or, or uh, uh, bars, if you will. And you can, you can find that uh, very, very clearly. Germans are more complicated, though. These areas in Ohio, very Democratic voting areas, uh, back in this time, again, in the Gilded Age. Uh, same true with a lot of these counties in southern Pennsylvania. Where it was different was in states where the Democrats controlled, where southern Democrats controlled, like Missouri and Texas. Here it was just the opposite, because it was southerners who control the Democratic, uh, people of southern background in Missouri, who control the state Democratic Party, and the Southern Democrats tended to be uh, uh, much more dry than the Northern Democrats, much more in favor of prohibition. So in Missouri, it was actually the, the German areas that became strongly Republican, and same in Texas with the German Hill Country to the west of, of Austin. So it depends on what state you were in, how this German ethnic vote uh, would go. And what's really interesting is to see some of these patterns persisted for a long time, Sometime you can still see remnants of them or aspects. By and large, it disappeared. Many of these disappeared in the 20th century, but not all, by any means. OK, we're going to move now up to a pivotal election, 1892, when everything starts to change, where these deeply ingrained patterns that we had seen through the Gilded Age start to break down. And I'll uh, begin with an image of Mary E. Lease. Uh, populist Mary E. Lee, who advised farmers, we're talking about farmers in the uh, Great Plains particularly, in places like Kansas and Nebraska, uh, farmers in the more newly settled part of the, of the Midwest. But she advised farmers to raise less corn and more hell. She also said that uh, if one man has not enough to eat three, not enough to eat three times a day and another man has 25 million, the last man has something that belongs to the first. Redistributionist, uh, definitely by today's standard. Uh, she was well known as an orator. Uh, William White said that she, could, uh, what did he say? that she could read the multiplication table out loud and make it seem interesting. Uh, one of these so-called prairie populists who were emerging out of the Great Plains at this time and really challenging the order. Uh, there's a couple reasons why the Great Plains became such a hotbed of political discontent uh, of farmers raising less corn and more hell at this time. One as actually a series of uh, droughts that were striking the Great Plains. In the 1870s were a relatively wet decade and farmers had pushed the plow into fairly dry areas of the central Great Plains that really didn't have enough rainfall to support agriculture. Then you have a dry period in the 1880s, and they are having a, a period of crisis. Another issue had to do with the money policy. Uh, the Bourbon Democrats like Grover Cleveland, as well as the Republicans, were hard currency advocates. They wanted the gold standard uh, and uh, hard money, but that meant deflation. There wasn't that much gold to go around at the time. There were shortages of gold. So with the dollar being pegged to gold, the economy's expanding. The gold supply isn't. That means you get, uh, you get uh, deflation. And deflation was terrible news for indebted farmers, 
Farmers had to borrow a lot of money for agricultural machinery, for their supplies, just to get through the, uh, the winter time or even the summer until the new crop comes in. So farmers tend to be debtors. And when you have a deflationary environment, that means the debtors are going to have to pay off more money than they, had, than they otherwise would have had to, uh, to do. So there was a lot of real distress at this time uh, uh, going on. What this populist movement uh, had as its first platform was to get rid of the gold standard to go to basically uh, silver or at least bimetallism, uh, but to have what they call free coinage of silver, which meant that anybody could take silver into a mint, like you could with gold in those days, turn in your silver, and get coinage. And they wanted it in the ratio of, of 16 pounds of silver to one pound of gold, which was not how silver was trading in the open market. This is a policy that would have, uh, had it been enacted, would have led to currency inflation. Uh, it would have meant then that debtors would have been paying off their debts with cheaper dollars in a, in a way. So it would have been very beneficial to farmers who had these big debts. It would not have been beneficial to financial interests. So it was very much opposed by the sort of financial uh, establishment. The populists, though, had a lot of other uh, ideas considered radical at the time. It's interesting, a lot of them uh, later came to pass. Uh, for example, they wanted a regulation of banks. They wanted a graduated income tax, in other words, a progressive income tax, where the wealthy have to pay higher percentages uh, on, their, on their marginal income. Uh, they wanted senators to be directly elected. Back in this day, U.S. senators were elected by the state legislatures, not by the people. Uh, they wanted an eight-hour workday, and they wanted government control of railroads, telegraphs, and the new telephone system. Railroads were a huge issue. Uh, the populace viewed railroads as monopolistic, as charging farmers far too much money, as being far too cozy with uh, uh, financial interests, and that was a big part of their platform. Well, you can see where the populace did well in the vote of, uh, they formed a new party, the populist party. And they did extremely well in some of the great Plains states, Kansas and Nebraska, also pretty well in North Dakota. And they did really well in Colorado, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and Nevada. Why Idaho, Nevada, Colorado? Silver mines. That was what really the economy of those states were all about in those days. There wasn't much in Nevada, but silver mines. That's, that was the, the game in town. And of course, if the US were to move to a, a, a silver a standard of this free coinage of silver, it would have been tremendously beneficial for silver miners. So silver miners uh, pushed it a lot. They got some support in the South. And it's actually interesting. Uh, you can see Alabama uh, shaded in. Uh, the colors are a bit uh, washed out. Actually, North uh, Carolina, they didn't do too bad. And in fact, in North Carolina, the populace started uh, um, make, making interesting um, arrangements. They allied themselves with the Republicans. They formed what they called the Fusion Party. Uh, they didn't agree on a lot of issues, uh, but they, they agreed that they did not like the Democratic Party, which was becoming more and more the party of white supremacy in the South. And this populist uh, Republican Fusion Party in North Carolina uh, was sort of the last stand of African-American enfranchisement in the South. Uh, uh, they were actually uh, 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 voting, highly engaged in this, and the white backlash against that fusion movement pretty much killed the populist party uh, in the South, particularly in North Carolina. So uh, what else do you see on this map? You see not doing well in the Northeast, not doing well in the new industrial cities, not doing well among the laboring uh, classes. And the populace made efforts to make connections with the, uh, the, laboring, uh, labor, the new labor unions. Uh, it's hard to say how sincere those were. There was a lot of nativism in the populist movement, suspicion of immigrants, suspicion of cities, very strong uh, sort of sense of the cities as seats of uh, of, of, of decadence, uh, if you will. And urban workers weren't too sure that this was going to be a good deal for them. 
Uh, they liked the idea of, of cheap food. They didn't want agricultural prices to go up. Uh, they liked the idea of protectionism. Uh, so definitely something that, um, that uh, marriage did not happen. And I'm sorry, I for, <laughs> on this earlier slide, I forgot to mention uh, my point here. Dorothy Gale question mark. Does that, does that word mean, name mean anything to you, Dorothy Gale? Dorothy of the Wizard of Oz. And there is a, uh, a thesis, highly, highly uh, debated, that the Wizard of Oz is all about the gold standard. That the yellow brick ro road is the gold standard. Dorothy evidently originally had silver slippers. Uh, the the uh, uh, tin man without a heart is the industrial worker. He's, his heart's been destroyed by capitalism. The scarecrow is the, uh, the farmer. Uh, it goes on and on. Like I say, a lot of, a lot of people don't think much of this sort of allegorical reading of The Wizard of Oz and basically say it was a uh, story for children and uh, doesn't go much beyond that. But some say that she was the uh, um, inspiration for Baum's Wizard of Oz. Well, what happens in this election? Well, you can see the populace taking uh, several states uh, getting uh, electoral votes in North Dakota, winning in Kansas and in Colorado and Nevada, uh, but nowhere else. You can see the uh, Democrats under, again, Grover Cleveland. He was in, he was out, he comes back in again. Uh, second contest between Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison. This time, Cleveland takes uh, New York. Uh, this time you can see see the Democrats taking Wisconsin, which was a bit of a shocker at the time. And again, a lot of that has to do with the, the German vote and the alcohol question. Some evidence would suggest that a lot of uh, people in the labor movement voted for Cleveland because Benjamin Harrison had uh, pretty, pretty viciously shut down a major strike in Homestead, Pennsylvania, uh, virtual labor warfare in one of Andrew Carnegie's uh, uh, plants. Uh, troops came in, it was pretty bloody, and workers were saying, well, we were told by the Republicans that a high tariff would mean improved conditions for workers, but it wasn't happening. Actually, uh, wages for workers were often being uh, cut at this time. So uh, it didn't work out that way. Anyway, in 1893, we have another financial panic. And this is actually from a Broadway melodrama of the time. A Broadway melodrama on a crisis in the affairs of great financial institutions. It would be pretty interesting to see a reenactment of something like that. So you're going to think that a financial panic is going to hurt the party in power, uh, which is the Democrats, uh, well, and, uh, which it did. Also, another huge strike, this one, the Pullman strike uh, in Illinois. This time, the Democrat, Grover Cleveland, calls in the federal troops to put it down. So labor strife is a, is a huge issue. It tends to uh, discredit the Democrats, uh, certainly in the eyes of nascent uh, labor movement. So what is then going to happen? You've got an industrializing society. You've got labor unrest. You just had a financial crisis. Who is going to take on this system? Well, the person who rises up from the plains, from Nebraska, William Jennings Bryan, uh, the, uh, the boy orator of the Platte, also known as the great commoner. What Bryan did was take the populist movement, merge it with the Democratic Party, and add a strong leavening of religious fundamentalism and a sort of uh, almost a messianic uh, uh, view of politics. He made the famous speech in the Democratic Convention that the workers and farmers are being crucified on a cross of gold. Uh, the uh, thorny crown is being placed on their heads by the financial interests, by the banks, by the railroads, by the gold standard more than anything else. And according to this Wizard of Oz interpretation, actually, Brian is the cowardly lion, uh, actually because in the next election he didn't push it quite as hard as he did in the first. Uh, who knows? But William Jennings Bryan uh, 
takes, on, takes over the Democratic Party to a certain extent, uh, is nominated uh, to run for president. And this election then became a very, uh, very uh, tough uh, party, a deaf election. The Eastern financial establishment was not at all pleased when they look at, looked at William Jennings Bryan. The New York Times referred to him as an irresponsible, unregulated, ignorant, prejudiced, pathetically honest, and enthusiastic crank. And, uh, enthusiasm has, has sort of changed its connotation. Back in those days, enthusiasm was uh, what we today might consider over-enthusiasm with religious overtones uh, often uh, with it. New York Tr Tribune uh, referred to him as a wretched rattle-pated boy. I tried to look up rattle-pated. I, I couldn't find it in my dictionary. Uh, posing in vapid vanity and mouthing resounding rottenness. Well, they're going for uh, alliteration, to be sure. <laughs> and the Philadelphia Press called his, referred to his followers as hideous and repulsive vipers. So again, if you think things are over the top uh, today, well, there's a long heritage in American politics of doing this sort of thing. So what William Jennings Bryan was able to do was to merge the interior west, the mining states, the Great Plains, with the exception of North Dakota, and the south, a coherent block against the northeast, the Great Lakes, and most of the Pacific coast. But where was most of the population was in the red zone. William McKinley, Republican candidate, hard money man, gold standard man, with a pretty impressive uh, political machine behind him. It's estimated that uh, McKinley, aided by Marcus Hanna, who was the sort of master of the Republican Party at this time, it's estimated that they spent about $7 million uh, versus $300,000 for Bryan. But one thing Bryan did was to campaign very energetically. He was one of the first to drop this notion that the presidential uh, aspirant should be dignified and not campaign. He traveled extensively and uh, did everything he could, uh, but suffered certainly in the Electoral College a fairly uh, resounding defeat. And one thing that you see with this, and here we have some county maps with the Republicans here in blue, unfortunately, but look at Wisconsin, which had gone for the Democratic Party uh, in the previous election. It's entirely going Republican. Uh, William Jennings Bryan was a, um, a teetotaler himself. He said that prohibition should be a local issue. Eventually, he became a national prohibitionist. But this sort of evangelical uh, uh, creed of William Jennings Bryan did not play well in uh, German areas. And you see, uh, especially in Wisconsin, in Minnesota as well, a wholesale rejection. Uh, yes, a question? Just a comment. Um when teen drinking fell across the United States, two states it didn't fall in, California and Wisconsin. Oh, <laughs> interesting. When, 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 when teen drinking fell, Wisconsin and California not going along with that. Yeah, that, that's, I hadn't realized that's quite interesting. Look, look at some of these patterns. I mean, one thing you can see is how much control the Democratic Party had at the state level in South Carolina. Uh, and you can see that states really did matter. Compare South Carolina uh, and Georgia. Look at Mississippi. Look at how intensely uh, Democratic voting many of these areas were uh, in the South. Uh, you can see long-standing patterns of Republican support in eastern Tennessee, parts of southeastern Kentucky as well. But you know, look, at, look at New England, uh, entirely going for uh, uh, William McKinley in this election. So again, a real clear democratic, excuse me, uh, dem demographic divide here in this election. Uh, under William McKinley, the United States goes to war with Spain, takes over the Philippines. This political cartoon is from an uh, anti-imperialist, uh, The White Man's Burden, which was a Rudyard Kipling poem basically addressed to McKinley urging him to take up the white man's burden and colonize the Philippines and take it over, which the United States did. Uh, it results, so you can see Uncle Sam here, and you can see the, the, uh, the British uh, and the Germans and others writing on the backs of the colonized uh, subjects. Some former Republican uh, liberals and mugwumps like Mark Twain were horrified by this. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, equally horrified. He was an absolute anti-imperialist uh, from the word go. 
But overall, it was uh, pretty popular, especially by the election of 1900. Uh, the war with Spain was over, didn't last long. American public generally likes fast, victorious wars. Those tend to sell pretty well. Uh, there was actually an insurgency in the Philippines that went on for quite a while, which wasn't as popular, but it didn't get that much attention. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, again against William McKinley. You can see, though, Bryan at this point didn't even win his own state of Nebraska. He's losing his appeal. Uh, the economic times are good. The full dinner pail, as William McKinley called it, and the country went pretty convincingly uh, for this. So you have a, a high tariff regime, uh, many would associate at the time with uh, prosperity. That's interesting. In this election, one thing that's happening is a new movement's emerging again. That's sort of parallel to the populist but different. This was the progressive movement. Where the populists were a, a movement for reform coming from below, the progressives were a reform movement coming from above, from the, the, the wealthier, more educated uh, segment of the populace. And basically, uh, both movements, particularly the progressives, were responding to the industrialization of the country, which neither party really had addressed. Uh, they were not dealing with labor issues. They were not dealing with a lot of the dislocations of urbanization uh, and so on. Uh, the progressive movement tended to be very much opposed to the creation of trusts, monopolies that were emerging, monopolies in uh, oil, but in a, a huge array of other uh, uh, industries as well. Here's a political cartoon showing the Copper Trust and Standard Oil and the Iron Trust and the Sugar Trust and Coal Trust and others that I haven't even heard of, referring to them as uh, bosses of the Senate. The progressive movement was not, uh, didn't respect party lines. Uh, you found Democrats and Republicans. Overall, the Republicans a bit more. Uh, what the progressives wanted to do was to sort of uh, use experts to create a more efficient uh, economic system, experts working with the government to oversee and to regulate. They wanted to take on issues of environment that had been completely ignored before. The frontier was closed now. Uh, uh, species were going extinct. There were uh, issues associated with the environment that uh, come on initially uh, with the progressives. They're interested in some social welfare. They want child uh, uh, labor uh, uh, laws. Uh, they want a limited work day. Uh, a whole oh, a series of reforms. They're also, in some cases, even though it's a top-down movement, they are pushing for more direct democracy. Uh, they agree on the direct election of senators. It's the progressives who first start pushing things like uh, recall of elected officials, initiatives and referenda. That comes out of the progressive uh, movement uh, at the time. Well, the Republicans in uh, 1900 are divided. They have the old guard, uh, which wanted things as they were, and they got, have this new, strong, progressive movement. So as often happens, they end up with a progressive as the vice presidential candidate who was often pilloried at the time, Theodore Roosevelt. And here's how he is depicted in an anti-progressive cartoon as the wild eastern terror in the mild west. This is from Chicago. So he is portrayed as a wild, crazy cowboy. Of course, he was from a very wealthy New York family, but he had spent some years in South Dakota on a ranch uh, <coughs> at a very sort of active, vigorous approach uh, to government. He was an ardent imperialist, but he was a progressive uh, through and through. Uh, Marcus Hanna uh, told William McKinley after the election, your job is to, uh, is to survive and not die. Well, what happened to McKinley? Uh, he was shot by an anarchist, and Theodore Roosevelt becomes president and starts pushing through the progressive reform agenda. Yes? Oh, it's his birthday? It's Roosevelt's birthday today. But thanks for bringing that up. That's, <laughs> how old would he be? <laughs> uh, Roosevelt was a popular president. The Democrats didn't know what to do. They went back to Alton Parker, another one of these bourbon Democrats, hard money man, the antithesis of William Jennings Bryan, thorough social conservative, financial conservative, pretty much conservative uh, all the way through. Uh, 
And you can see the West now has shifted entirely into this progressive Republican camp. And you have the Southeast against the rest of the country. A very, very clear pattern. If you look at something like California, you can see this uh, blue were the Democratic voting counties. Uh, not very much. Overwhelming support in California for Roosevelt and the progressive movement. California had a very strong uh, progressive Republican establishment. Uh, Hiram Johnson, California, later California governor, was sort of the left wing of the progressive movement, uh, if you will, coming out of the California Republicans. So California, a very interesting state to look at this time. If we can look at it, this same election, you know, look at this, again, stark geographical divide where we can see the Democrats getting virtually no support in the West, in the Northeast, just a scattering of counties. And again, you can see South Carolina uh, with its distinctive pattern of overwhelming support uh, for the Democrats' conservative party at this time. Uh, 1908, uh, Theodore Roosevelt had, had um, pledged that he wouldn't seek another term. He didn't. He actually had a hand-picked successor to a, a certain extent, William Howard Taft. Uh, who probably didn't really want to be president. Taft always wanted to be a Supreme Court justice, and he, and he sort of ended up there. So he was sort of reluctant. Uh, he, uh, Roosevelt thought that he was a progressive and would continue in the progressive line. The Democrats had been so thoroughly defeated four years earlier, they went back to uh, William Jennings Bryan, who now is reinventing himself as a sort of quasi-progressive, at least in, in some uh, aspects. Uh, he gets some silver states, he gets his home state of Nebraska again, but uh, by and large doing worse than he had before. So it looks like uh, the high tide for the progressive movement, but what happens? What happens is that, well, at least according to Roosevelt, Taft betrayed him. Uh, the Taft betrayed the progressive agenda, according to Theodore Roosevelt, and once he got in office, associated himself with the old guard conservative uh, Republican uh, movement and was not pushing any of these other sort of progressive uh, agenda elements that Roosevelt so clearly wanted. So Roosevelt had been in Europe. He comes back and he's determined to get the party uh, control of the Republican Party again. Uh, there are some primaries now. That's something that came in with the progressives. Uh, Roosevelt did extremely well. But Taft controlled the party machinery, Taft was nominated, and Roosevelt rebels. And then you get what I think is the most uh, interesting election in U.S., or at least one of the most interesting elections in U.S. history, the election of 1912, where you have uh, the Progressive Party, Bull Moose Party, as it's called, a famous story of uh, Roosevelt saying he was as fit as a bull moose. This was the campaign where Roosevelt was shot uh, right before he gave a speech, and the bullet uh, went through his, 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 uh, his paper, his, his speech, and lodged in his very uh, massive pectoral muscle. Uh, he pulls the speech out, covered with blood, and reads it, spends an hour and a half or so on the hustings, uh, and proved to the world that, yes, he's as tough as a bull moose. Uh, he knew he wasn't going to win with the Republicans' uh, party being split, uh, but he wanted to send the election into the House of Representatives and see what would uh, happen there. Uh, the Democrats had nominated Woodrow Wilson, who was governor of New Jersey, former president of Princeton University, a uh, man of the South, though, definitely a, a southerner uh, from Virginia. He, I think he had, uh, spent time in Georgia as well. Uh, Wilson was, represented the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. He had... Uh, basically made good with William Jennings Bryan and had Bryan's support. Bryan became his Secretary of State once he uh, was elected. Uh, but with the Republican split, it was the time for the Democrats to uh, win. And you see, uh, in a three-way race, Woodrow Wilson wins Illinois with 35% of the vote. Uh, Wilson, excuse me, Roosevelt gets 33%, and most of the rest uh, to Taft. Taft, sitting president, won only Vermont and Utah. A very, a very poor showing, uh, not much enthusiasm. He, he got quite a few votes in New England and, and upstate New York, uh, not much elsewhere uh, except Utah and some parts of uh, Idaho. 
California got uh, virtually uh, no support at all. Also, it's interesting that this is the high tide of socialism in the United States. Eugene Debs uh, with 6% of the vote. The socialists emerged about 1900, a period when uh, the parties weren't paying much attention to labor issues. They tried to step in and, and, uh, and gain some uh, power. They, won a number, they, had a, they had two members of Congress. Uh, they did win a number of counties. I uh, can't see anything on this map. Yes, question? Why are the electoral votes so much more decisive than the popular? Well, it, it, yes, it, it certainly is true. I suppose it's just a, a, a mathematical issue uh, where you have so, you know, here we're talking about millions of votes, and uh, here we're talking about 500 or so. So I suppose just statistically it would, it would turn out like that. But it is sort of odd, isn't it? You've, you know, you've, there have been electoral votes that are very, very close. 2,000 would be a, the classic case. But usually, uh, often too, you know, one or two big states can throw it pretty far in one direction or, or another. But yeah, that's, that's a, an, an interesting, uh, interesting comment. Uh, you can look at the progressive. This is Teddy Roosevelt's party. You can see South, South Dakota loved him. He had spent time there. But you can see California liked him a lot. Very popular. He wasn't on the ballot in Oklahoma. Uh, socialist Eugene Debs did better in uh, Oklahoma than any state other than Nevada. That's interesting. The socialists at this time, Oklahoma is a relatively new state. And the socialists were uh, working with African Americans and American Indians in Oklahoma at this time and uh, did very, very well until, um, until they were crushed, basically, by the uh, Wilson administration. You can see in the south, big difference between here, the, the, the southeast and the south central part of the country uh, at this time. Very, very uh, big difference. And here, again, it just shows California with the progressives in green and the Democrats in blue. Uh, you can see, look at the Bay Area. Wilson took San Mateo and San Francisco, but uh, Roosevelt basically took the Bay Area and took most of Southern California as well. Uh, the Socialists did quite well. Here's Eugene Debs getting 12% of the vote in San Francisco, 12% in San Mateo, 16 in Contra Costa, 9 in Santa Clara, 14 in Alameda. And I throw in uh, Nevada County and Calaveras County in the Sierra foothills. Those were the gold mining uh, counties. And the Socialists did very well at the time. You look at it today, these counties are... 60% Republican voting uh, uh, easily, and a socialist wouldn't get, uh, wouldn't get very many votes in uh, Calaveras County today. Uh, believe me, I grew up there, so I know that county pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Federal Reserve Districts. Well, I'm th throw this map in to talk a little bit about what Woodrow Wilson did uh, as president. He was a progressive Democrat. He pushed through a lot of uh, progressive reforms. Uh, he created a Federal Trade Commission. Uh, he lowered the tariff, but oh, that's interesting. The Democrats had always wanted to lower the tariff. But there's a problem, you lower the tariff, what about the revenue? The tariff was a huge source of revenue for the government, so you had to make up for it. The answer was a graduated income tax, which actually took a constitutional amendment to allow that to happen. So we get the first uh, income tax in the United States. Uh, we actually go back to a national bank that, uh, that, that the founder of the Democratic Party, Andrew Jackson, had destroyed the Federal Reserve Bank. So this goes against the Democratic mainstream. The genius of Wilson was to decentralize it. The Democrats were afraid of centralization. They didn't want too much power in Washington. So to break up the Federal Reserve System into these district banks, that's very much a, a, a Wilsonian a, a, approach. So Wilson, Wilson often considered, yes, a, a, a model, model liberal. He was in some aspects. He was also an ardent segregationist. He made sure the last integrated parts of the federal government were segregated. I uh, was not too uh, well disposed towards uh, uh, women's votes either, although he ultimately um, reluctantly ag agreed to it at the end of his term. Yes? Do the Federal Reserve districts reflect an economic geography? Do the Federal Reserve districts reflect an economic geography? Uh, well, to, to a certain extent, basically, we have the largest sort of financial centers in these areas. That's not really true anymore today. Charlotte's a much more important financial center than uh, Richmond, for example. Uh, I, uh, so not entirely. Uh, but yeah, they sort of market sheds to a certain extent, find the largest uh, cities in these different regions of the country. Uh, 
a pattern that basically holds, not maybe not entirely, but to a to a, to a, to a pretty uh, extensive uh, degree. Uh, 1916, uh, Wilson's running again, World War I in Europe, the United States with a lot of tension, the Germans had sunk the Lusitania, there was a lot of pressure for the United States to go to war, Woodrow Wilson runs against Charles Evans Hughes, later becomes a Supreme Court Justice. Uh, Hughes is a, a progressive, but it was thought that he could unite the progressive and the conservative wings of the Republican Party to defeat Wilson. Uh, Roosevelt did not want to continue this progressive party because he saw that it allowed the Democrats to come in. So he was in favor of Hughes, although uh, Roosevelt was a real thorn in his side because Will Roosevelt wanted to go to war. He wanted the U.S. to enter the war. Uh, Wilson was campaigning on the platform of, I've kept you out of war. Agricultural prices are great. You know, as, as the Europeans are slaughtering each other, Big benefit for American farmers, miners, and others. So times are good in the U.S. That's really helping uh, him. Uh, one of the reasons I bring up this photo is that Roosevelt was uh, disappointed that Hughes didn't do more. And he claimed the only difference between Wilson and Hughes is a shave. So you can, uh, uh, Ill 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 illustrated well by that. It's thought that uh, Hughes lost the election because he lost California, and he lost California, according to one view, because he, he came to Los Angeles, and he was in the same hotel as Hiram Johnson, the very progressive, or we could say liberal, Republican governor of California, and Hughes snubbed him. And he lost California by a few votes. He lost the election. Uh, so you can see, again, that same basic pattern with New Hampshire being a real outlier here. Uh, California uh, almost going for the Republicans, uh, but not quite. Well, the United States does go to war, despite what Wilson had said. Uh, you can see the vote against World War I, German speaking or German uh, background areas, places like Wisconsin, uh, German areas of, of Missouri, and others, very much against it overall. Uh, the vote was uh, quite clearly uh, in favor of going to war. Uh, Wilson is well known for his, uh, well, what many people would say was naive liberalism at the end of World War I. Wilson, a very moralistic, very religious man, thinking that he could establish a, uh, a, a war to end wars and could remap Europe afterwards uh, to ensure peace. Uh, this did not work very well uh, among European diplomats. His idea for a League of Nations was roundly rejected in the United States. So didn't seem to work out very well. At the same time, he pushed a very regressive regime in the United States uh, at, uh, during World War I and at the end. Uh, So-called Palmer Raids, uh, editorial cartoon, uh, uh, looking at them. Uh, the United States government was sending out agents to arrest uh, supposed subversives uh, hitting the German-American community very, very hard indeed. That's one reason why Prohibition came about after uh, the end of World War I in, in 1919, because the German community had been pretty much politically uh, uh, neutered to a certain extent because of this intense anti-German sentiment. Uh, there was a, uh, afterwards, it was widely agreed that Wilson and Palmer uh, went way too far in attacking people who supposedly uh, were uh, subversives against the United States. And also, well, what else happened? Wilson had a stroke. That didn't help very much. Became incapacitated. And after the war, uh, demobilization was not planned out very well. Agricultural prices uh, uh, dropped. There was, again, unrest. And the country turned against the Democrats in a huge way. Uh, the Republicans nominating uh, uh, Will, uh, Harding, who was, um, oh, by most measures, one of the, the least illustrious of U.S. presidents. He seemed to be more interested in playing poker and, and drinking, even though he was uh, in favor of prohibition. He, he liked to, to drink a few. Not very active at all. High levels of corruption in his administration. A teapot dome scandal uh, in the West, selling of oil leases and so on. 
uh, you can see that uh, uh, the Democratic uh, uh, nominee Cox, uh, supposedly a, a pretty uh, upstanding fellow, but uh, he was campaigning on the basis of the U.S. joining the League of Nations, and the country did not want it, winning only in the South. It might be kind of surprising that the South was in favor of this kind of internationalism, but it was at the time. The rest of the country uh, wasn't uh, at all. So a huge uh, defeat. I mean, look at, the, look at the popular vote, 60 versus 34 percent. Just a total uh, wipeout, uh, essentially. Uh, finish. Oh, I wanted to show this because the socialists are pretty much gone by this time. The only place they're hanging on is up in the Iron Range of Minnesota, up in the Duluth area. Now, partly this has to do with the fact that this is a heavily unionized iron mining area. And partly it had to do with there are so many Finns living here, because it's, it's pretty well established that the socialist movement was dominated by Germans, Jews, and Finns. Uh, uh, and I'm not really sure how the Finnish connection works here, but it's interesting. Actually, this area recently came up in, in a McCain uh, campaign. Uh, anyone note that? Um, what's her name? Nancy, um, Nancy Flotenhauer? Is that her name? McCain aide? Who, who made the comment about Northern Virginia not being real Virginia. She talked about Republican voting areas and she included the Iron Range of Northern Minnesota. Uh -uh. This is a very Democratic voting area and has been uh, for quite a while. This was, the, this was the most socialistic part of the United States back in this early period. But socialism is pretty, other than that, well, the socialists got 10% in San Francisco, 10 in New York, 10%. So they had a, a few areas. But basically, World War I, the Palmer Raids, and then prosperity in the 20s, right? A prosperous period that pretty much did in the socialists. They continued to run candidates, but not much. 1924, the Democrats uh, nominated an even more conservative person, John Davis, uh, ultimately originally from West Virginia, the Republicans, uh, Cal, uh, Calvin Coolidge. Uh, both very conservative. We're again in a very, very conservative period here in the United States. The progressives, what was left of them, bolted. Uh, Robert La Follette of Wisconsin formed another progressive party. Only one Wisconsin, but you can see did get 16% of the vote, trying to recreate this um, a movement of Teddy Roosevelt, wanting more government uh, uh, regulation, wanting more uh, democracy, wanting a better break for uh, workers particularly. He was the creator of what's sometimes called the Wisconsin system, where the state government worked very closely with the University of Wisconsin for public health measures and sort of basic uh, uh, public uh, benefit. Uh, if you see his strong area of support, a northern and western uh, geography. The map maybe doesn't do it justice. It's interesting looking at our local area uh, Coolidge uh, won most uh, of the counties around here, but look at the Democratic candidate, Davis, 6% in San Francisco, 6 in Marin, 5 in San Mateo. So the Democrats were dead in California at this time. No support. It was a southern party. Uh, and no support here uh, at all. And La Follette definitely second place uh, at this time. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit with this, but on to the next election. The Democrats, again, had had this cr uh, crisis, right, doing so poorly. So at the 1928 election, it's a battle between the wets and the dries, the prohibitionists and the anti-prohibitionists. And this is in a day of national prohibition. So the Democrats, uh, I said a southern party, but in a way I misspoke because it was southern party and large cities of the northeast, New York City, Boston especially, but other large cities which... Uh, had uh, yeah, a very large population at the time compared to other areas. It was before mass suburbanization. And there was this epic battle between the wets and the dries, the southern, rural, eastern, urban branches of the Democratic Party. And it was the wets who won the nomination, uh, Al Smith of New York City. Uh, and this brings up another one of these national uh, contests, and it's interesting. Uh, New York Baptist minister John wrote straight, nothing considered one of the first radio preachers in the country, who had this to say about Al Smith. Well, he equated him with the urban evils of card playing, 
cocktail drinking poodle dogs. Woo. <laughs> Divorces, novels, stuffy rooms, dancing, evolution, Clarence Darrow, overeating, nude art, prize fighting actors, greyhound racing, and modernism. It's an odd mixture. Today, <laughs> today you wouldn't be putting overeating and uh, prize fighting in with modernism and uh, nude art, I don't think. So, so you get an idea of how, how political ideas sort of rearrange themselves over time. Well, how did Al Smith do? Not well at all. Uh, Democrats taking Massachusetts and uh, Rhode Island for the first time, although it was almost entirely because of Boston and Providence. Rural areas didn't vote for him, but uh, Boston certainly did. Uh, these are areas that are heavily Irish, uh, so no be surprised. And then keeping the Deep South only. Lots of, of um, Southerners rejecting the Democratic Party because of the Catholicism of Al Smith. Irish, Catholic, from New York. He still got the Deep South, which is, uh, which is interesting. So loyally Democratic. But the border states uh, rejecting the Democratic Party at this time. Well, everything changes the next election because of the Great Depression. We go from a red map to a blue map. We go to one of uh, Herbert Hoover being reduced to the far northeast. He won a lot of upstate New York. Uh, he won areas in northern Illinois. He won those Republican areas in uh, uh, Tennessee. He won much of uh, many counties in Utah, but he only took a handful of states. Roosevelt coming in overwhelmingly and coming in with a new philosophy of government. This really hadn't been done before, where the federal government is going to directly act to uh, regulate many areas of the economy and to offer help to people through things like the uh, works, uh, public works uh, administration, giving jobs, uh, creating uh, big new government agencies, social security, social safety net, uh, and so forth. Just about any Democrat probably could have won the election. Uh, four years later, Roosevelt does even better. Alf Landon does not uh, win his uh, home state of Kansas. He picks up a, f uh, a, a few counties, but basically, as Republicans are reduced to two states, Maine and Vermont at this time. Uh, 61 to 36 percent, one of the biggest uh, blowout elections in American history. So basically, the entire country going. Things had improved from 32 to 36, no doubt about it. Actually, 37 saw another downturn. So we weren't out of the woods yet, but Roosevelt was certainly given a lot of credit for what had happened uh, in the New uh, Deal. And uh, Atlanta this time won no counties in, in, in most of the western states and a number of southern states as well. I mean, this, this was at the county level also an incredible uh, landslide. I do want to move through the rest of these pretty quickly. 1940, right before World War II, the Republicans nominate uh, Wendell Wilkie, who had been a Democrat. Uh, this was a, a, a sort of a shocking nomination. He was not a politician. He accepted much of the New Deal, but he didn't like the concentration of economic power. He was particularly upset about the Tennessee Valley Authority, where the government was building dams and creating an integrated economic development system and electrification system. And Wilkie had represented private utilities, and he didn't want to see the government taking over utilities. Uh, so he was uh, nominated and did much better. You can see taking back the Great Plains, uh, getting some of the industrial states in the Midwest, a county-level map. You can see that by 1940, uh, the Republicans doing very, very uh, well. They lost New York, but they won almost all the counties of New York. And, uh, uh, major areas sort of in the, in the heartland of the country. The South, not at all. Oh, here's the German hill country of Texas, so you can see that standing out uh, pretty clearly. Uh, not well in the West uh, at all. Uh, one thing that uh, Roosevelt, in, in the New Deal, a lot of money was pumped into the, into the uh, far Western states. Uh, dams, building, electrification, and so on, making Roosevelt pretty popular in the, in the far west as well as, as, uh, as in the south, and a lot of urban support as well. New Deal coalition, bringing together farmers, uh, workers, uh, people in uh, 
much of the country. So sort of creating a new kind of coalition that hadn't really been seen before, where the farmers and the industrial workers uh, brought together. In 1944, uh, the United States is at war at this time. Uh, Dewey nominated by the Republicans. Again, he is a, a reformer, had been an opponent to, of, uh, of political corruption, uh, sort of a, a crusading attorney. Got, a lot, uh, got more support, certainly, than the other opponents of Franklin Roosevelt did. Picked up a few more states. You can see 46 to 53. It's, uh, it's much closer than the uh, earlier elections had been. And he was a moderate as well. He uh, advocated, advocated keeping much of the New Deal, but making it more efficient, uh, reducing uh, some of what he considered to be the more uh, overreaching aspects of the New Deal. Uh, but again, you have uh, Roosevelt. But he dies shortly after this election. And his vice president, Harry Truman, comes in. Which leads up to another fascinating year, 1948, another four-candidate race, where we have Dewey running again for the Republicans. We have uh, President uh, Harry Truman running. We have Strom Thurmond of South Carolina and Henry Wallace, who had been uh, FDR's vice president uh, in his, what was that, third term. Uh, here you have the Democratic Party splitting in three. Uh, you have a right wing of the Democratic Party represented by Thurman of the South forming the Dixiecrat Party. And the Dixiecrats were furious because Truman, the Truman administration, was finally starting to say something about civil rights. This is something that the Democrats always wanted to ignore because they figured they'd lose the South if they pushed it. But Truman integrated the army. And thanks largely to a, uh, a politician from Minnesota named Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic platform called for civil rights at this time. So uh, the Southerners, Dixiecrats, pull out. Wallace represented Democrats who thought Truman was pushing too hard of a line against the Soviet Union, who did not want a Cold War, who did not want a sort of global confrontation. So he's opting out from the left. And everybody then was sure, of course, Dewey is going to win. And probably the most famous political photograph in American history is uh, newspapers being so confident that Dewey would win that they printed up uh, headlines. And there's Truman, uh, who knew he had won by that time. Uh, Wallace didn't do well. Actually, his party uh, fell apart. He was into some uh, sort of odd um, spirituality. Uh, he had a guru. Gurus didn't go over very well in 1948. Uh, <laughs> And actually, it probably helped Truman, because Truman would say he, could, he could, uh, didn't have to worry about being called soft on communism, because he had someone on his left. So he may have even uh, helped him. You can see Thurman won a number of states uh, in the far south, but Truman kept most of the south, kept most of the west. And th the urban cities, uh, excuse me, the eastern cities was able to uh, be elected again. You can see how, boy, did state boundaries matter a lot. This was the days when state political, uh, the party machinery could really control things. That doesn't happen so much anymore, but it did then. You can see Dewey is doing very well in uh, places like New York, but New York City, again, so important, giving its vote for Truman, and Truman getting the election, uh, obviously. The Republicans had a bit of a, uh, oh, um, well, let's jump ahead then to uh, 1952. Uh, the Republicans have a, uh, a split this time between the moderates. Uh, Dewey had certainly been a moderate who are accepting much of the New Deal versus, uh, versus the old guard led by Robert Taft of Ohio who were relatively isolationistic and did not like the New Deal at all. The Democrats had a, a number of splits. Actually, almost all these states are no primary states. Primaries were not very common then. And the primaries that were won, most of them were won by a Tennessee Democrat named Estes Kefauver, who was in, uh, quite an, um, he, was, he was interested in civil rights, not as much as uh, uh, you would consider a, a liberal position today, but for the time, definitely in favor of uh, civil rights. Adlai Stevenson, uh, not running in any of these primaries, but he got the nod from the Democrats. And Stevenson didn't talk about segregation. Again, just keep it off the table to keep the South. 
the Republicans had their, uh, their own split, and uh, they ended up going for the moderate of almost unknown political dimensions, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Again, going for the heroic general. The Democrats were at one time interested in Eisenhower, too. Nobody knew what his party was. And finally, he said, I'm a Republican. The Republicans uh, draft him. Korea is a big issue. The Korean War is going on. Eisenhower says, I will go to Korea, and I will make sure that the war is ended honorably. That worked uh, very well. Stevenson couldn't get traction, and uh, down he went. Uh, here's the two candidates. It's interesting. Adlai Stevenson uh, uh, had the unfortunate uh, um, pejorative term associated with him of egghead. Uh, you know, Google Stevenson and egghead. He was considered over-intellectual. Uh, also uh, comments on his looks, although Dwight Eisenhower looks like his head is a little bit more egg-shaped to me right now. Uh, but there was a lot, and they, these two men went against each other in 52 and in 56 again. And in 52, Eisenhower just crushes Stevenson. And I found it very interesting. And you know, a very intellectually oriented uh, Democrat winning in the South, again, winning big cities in the Northeast, but elsewhere in the country, not doing very well at all against the amiable uh, uh, general. And moderate, which is something that I think it's, it's important to understand from today. Here's a quote from Dwight D. Eisenhower, and I'll read it out loud. Should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There is a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes you can do these things. Among them are H.L. Hunt, a few other Texas oil millionaires, and an occasional politician or businessman from other areas. Their number is negligible, and they are stupid. Now, I haven't actually uh, verified this quote. It's from a Democratic website, uh, and, uh, but that is certainly how it is reported. Another interesting thing to look at is the top marginal income tax rate. A little bit of history there. 7% was the top rate when Wilson came in. It ratcheted up to 77% in the war. Wars are expensive. In the conservative 20s, it was kept but pushed down to 25%. FDR pushed it up to 75% in the Depression, up to 94% in World War II, and then from 45 to 64 all through the conservative Eisenhower years, it stayed at 91%. And one thing I should say about Eisenhower is he was is very much a moderate he let the Republican right wing uh, attack uh, communists and supposed communists. He didn't really object to Joseph McCarthy. His vice president, Richard Nixon, was famous as a, a red baiter uh, at this period. Uh, but when you look at his tax policies uh, today, uh, well, you can imagine how tax, uh, top marginal tax rate of 91% <laughs> would be framed in today's political climate. Under the Democrats, it dropped down to 70%. Under the Reagan era, era, down to 50 and then 28. Clinton brought it up to 39. It stands at 35% now. And there's obviously in this election lots of talk about well, uh, if that figure goes up again to something like 39, 40%. Um, that's something we can talk about more uh, uh, later on. In the election of 56, Eisenhower against Stevenson again. Stevenson at this time is advocating a less aggressive military policy around the world. He wants to reduce military spending, which was high in the 50s as a percentage of US GDP. He wanted to negotiate with the Soviet Union to reduce tensions. And lo and behold, the Russians invade Budapest and crush the Hungarian uprising. That doesn't do much for Stevenson's campaign at all. And in the next election, you can see, again, he picks up Missouri, but he loses some other southern states. It is a. Uh, another uh, uh, landslide election, the Democrats not doing well at all. And you can see, you can see even Cook County, you can see uh, the Cleveland area, I mean almost all of, uh, of Ohio, yeah, Boston, New York, Philadelphia going uh, for the Democratic Party, but not much else there at all. Uh, look at California too, look how the Bay Area is voting. Solidly Republican. It's the Central Valley in places like Lassen County that are going for the intellectual egghead Adlai Stevenson. Boy, have things changed in this country uh, in, in a huge, huge way. A look at the Iron Range uh, up in northern uh, Minnesota. Uh, 
very strongly for the Democratic Party at this time. Okay, I, I do want to quickly go through 1960 election, another uh, knife edge uh, election. Kennedy runs as a conservative Democrat. He totally switches. He's running on a stronger military platform. He says there's a missile gap that the Soviets are ahead of the United States. So he does a total switch on uh, Stevenson, uh, picks up enough st uh, states to win, although uh, there's a lot of allegations of fraud in Illinois and in Texas. If you look at the county map, uh, you can see that uh, Kennedy did not win much of Illinois, but he won Cook County. Uh, that was enough to push him uh, over the edge. And again, you can see uh, places like Santa Clara County, San Mateo County voting. You can't see San Francisco. It, it, uh, it went for Kennedy. But the larger counties in the Bay Area, not Alameda and Contra Costa, but Marin certainly uh, voting for uh, Nixon at this time. Uh, the Democrats uh, were, again, moving a little bit into uh, civil rights. And in fact, under Kennedy, and especially under Johnson, they'd go completely into civil rights. But we see the beginnings of another southern backlash where Mississippi and Louisiana, and you can't see on the map, but Alabama, a lot of their electors uh, bolted and went for um, Byrd instead of Kennedy. But it was enough for Kennedy to win. Of course, he's assassinated. And then the next election, 64, the Republican conservative wing has been waiting in the wings a long time. They are not happy with the moderate tendencies of the modern Republican Party. They want to go back to old principles. And it's interesting, a lot of young people especially were in favor of Barry Goldwater. The 1960s was a period of youth uh, ferment. Uh, a lot of young were going to the left, but others at this time in the early 60s were going to the, uh, to the far right. Uh, Barry Goldwater wanted to reverse a lot of the New Deal programs. He wanted a much stronger military approach against the Soviet Union. Uh, his campaign slogan was, in your heart, you know he's right. The Democrat rejoinder, you know, right. in your guts, you know he's nuts, was what uh, uh, was responded. And there was um, certainly a lot of advertisements suggesting that thermonuclear war could well result. Look at the election, though. It's a total reversal. What happened? Goldwater from Arizona was, was not really a segregationist, but he was an ardent federalist. He's actually going back to the states' rights program that used to be associated with the Democratic Party. Now he's taking it as a Republican platform, and he's basically saying, oh, it's up to the states to determine civil rights issues. That's not a federal issue. And so you see the far south, which had been the Democratic stronghold, abandoning the Democratic Party going for Goldwater. It almost makes you think this was really the only issue in these areas. Blacks weren't voting, white voting uh, virtually entirely in these states. But a huge, huge blowout election. You can see again, you go up into uh, the Northeast, hardly a county going for uh, Goldwater. Upper Midwest, hardly any counties. Uh, just the far south and some of the Great Plains big parts of Utah and Idaho, a little bit in Montana as well, and uh, Arizona. One of the biggest blowout elections that we've had. Let me just really quickly get us up to uh, the next election. Maybe I will stop with the, the following election, uh, 1968, uh, Vietnam War in full uh, spate. Uh, president Johnson declines to run. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, who well known as a civil rights uh, stalwart, uh, running against Richard Nixon again, who had been defeated by Kennedy. St Humphrey is, like I say, a civil rights stalwart. Voting Rights Act had been passed. The South is not happy. And they go for Alabama's George Wallace uh, as an independent. And you can see. Uh, the far south going for Wallace, uh, Humphrey getting most of the northeast, surprisingly for the day getting Texas, but virtually uh, nothing else. And then I will conclude, oh, 68, you can, see, you can see Wallace's support. Deep south, not in the border states so much, certainly not uh, in Oklahoma. Again, you can see the areas of the Democrats with Humphrey, parts of New England, uh, the more urban parts of New England, scattered counties elsewhere, 
uh, and still a good amount of support in Texas. And finally, I'll conclude with 1972, where the Democrats go to the far left. McGovern was uh, pilloried as being the candidate of amnesty, abortion, and acid, uh, LSD. Certainly nothing that he supported, but that's what the rumor mill uh, viewed him as. So this is a campaign where uh, the Democrats go quite far to the left. The Republicans push law and order, and we have an election where the Democrats are reduced to Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. And we look at that county pattern, and what do we see? Uh, we see only Alameda County. Oh, can you explain Yolo County up here? UC Davis? So uh, uh, sometimes we can explain uh, um, some of McGovern's uh, uh, areas. He's got cities. He's got New York. He's got Philadelphia. He's got St. Louis. Blacks are finally starting to vote in places like the Black Belt of Alabama. So he's getting some votes. He's getting some of the Hispanic votes in Texas and in northern uh, New Mexico, Butte, Montana, coal mi uh, mining area, some Indian reservations, back up here into the Mesabi Range, the Iron Range area. Um, so some of these are, I can't explain Cottle County, Texas voting for McGovern for the life of me, but what it seems to have been is there, uh, there had been um, some important local leaders associated with the Democratic Party who were still loyal. Uh, the, rest of, the rest of central northern Texas, yes, abandoning the Democratic Party. And that county, Cottle County, now solidly Republican voting. So I was going to go up a little bit more, but I do want to have some time for questions. I'm sorry we don't have more. So let me stop my narrative there, and I will pick up with uh, Jimmy Carter uh, next week and bring us all the way up to the present. So I welcome any comments or questions that any of you may have about this long sweep of US electoral history. So what caused the big switch in uh, 1968 from blue to the red with, with Johnson's very blue map to yeah, OK, that's a, that's a great question. I should have had time. So yes, we see with, with Johnson uh, winning here, uh, real fear of, of Goldwater. When, then when Johnson comes in with a huge uh, congressional majority, he had, it's a, also a major gain in the House and the Senate for the Democrats. And also with the assassination of John F. Kennedy having been fairly recent, the Democrats are really able to push through uh, what is now a very liberal social agenda, or at least for the time. So we have the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and a number of other crucial uh, civil rights uh, legislation. Uh, but then there's a bit of a backlash that comes in. Uh, after that happens, there's a big spate of urban rioting. Uh, Watts in Los Angeles uh, and a lot of other places, there's uh, racial tension and racial uh, animosity. And a lot of people then sort of had concluded that we had gone too far on this issue. Crime was really building rapidly. Uh, which had a lot to do with it. And then there was the disaster of the Vietnam War. Uh, there were economic problems as well. Johnson was trying to push everything at once. This very expensive war in Southeast Asia, these very expensive social programs. That led to inflation ticking up. Uh, it led to this sort of the beginning of the end of the great boom period of the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, Richard Nixon in 68 runs on a very strong law and order uh, program that helps. Uh, but maybe the biggest thing is that the Democrats in 1968 were totally torn apart over the Vietnam War. It was a war zone in Chicago in their convention with anti-war protesters against uh, the police force uh, uh, being basically pushed forward by Mayor Richard Daley, who was the Democratic old-time political boss of Chicago. And it led to a pretty ugly campaign. Uh, here's uh, Humphrey, who had been the great civil rights champion, being followed by young hecklers calling him a fascist uh, because of the Vietnam War. And just imagine uh, what that did to him. Uh, at the very end, he took an anti-Vietnam stance. Uh, and Johnson cut off the aerial bombing. And Humphrey did uh, pick up votes at the time, but, but, uh, but not enough. Uh, to lead to that pretty resounding victory by Richard Nixon. And I'm sure a lot of you remember this a lot better than I do. I was a little kid at the time. <laughs> so it's, uh, but I'm sure, like I say, a lot of you know this much more directly. So uh, yes, back. Well, I was wondering the extent to which the decline of population of the Democratic Northern cities uh -huh. 
affects the change during, during that period? Yeah, the question is the decline of uh, northern cities. The most of uh, the big northeastern cities reached their demographic peak in the 1950s, early 1960s. So it's really not ha happening in much of a big way. Uh, it's starting to happen now in, in, the, in the late 60s, that 68 map. Uh, and again, a lot of that is pushed forward by federally mandated busing to achieve racial integration. That came out of the Johnson Great Society era. It was actually the courts that pushed that much more than the Congress. That led to a lot of white flight out of, uh, out of many cities. Uh, when that happened, the tax base starts to decline. Uh, also, you have certain industries uh, starting to decline as well. And so you get this massive drop. Uh, Detroit now has half the population that it did in 1955. So that's really going to start uh, playing in a little bit later. But by the Reagan era, it's a pretty big factor because these central cities that had been such a strong core zone of support for the Democrats just don't have as many people. And so the Democrats can't rely on those areas nearly to the extent that they had before. Interesting question. Um, yes? Uh, I have read that, or know that, that uh, religion has played a big part in uh, how people vote in coming in this century. Yes. Has it been um, a big theme throughout the history of the United States? Now the question is, how important is religion? Certainly today, it's an important factor, especially the frequency of religious observation, as I brought up before. We saw in the late 1800s uh, how there was a divide uh, between the more pietistic and more liturgical branches of Christianity. Uh, it came up in, uh, basically in certain elections. The first Catholic ever to run was Al Smith in 28, and there was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment, and he's... He lost votes. He gained some votes actually in Catholic areas uh, that went to the Democrats and hadn't four years earlier, but overall he lost votes. Then when Kennedy came in in 60, it was, uh, there was a lot of fear that it would be another big uh, issue. And Kennedy went to great lengths to assure the country that he was not going to be beholden to the Catholic Church and that he really believed in separation of church and state. And it, it seemed to have worked pretty well. That map of, uh, you can find... If you go back to the map of 1960 and try to understand why that Kansas County, I think that's Ellis County, uh, voted for Kennedy, uh, has to do with very heavy German, excuse me, Catholic population, uh, German, Czech, and other uh, immigrant groups in that county. So you can pick it up uh, a little bit. Uh, by and large, though, the big gap between the religious and the less religious starts in 1992 is when you first see it really clearly. In the uh, election of uh, uh, George Bush uh, Sr. and uh, Dukakis in 88, it's only a couple percent. It's when Clinton comes in that it becomes strong, and then even, even stronger in 2000 and 2004. So yeah, there are, were religious patterns, but you didn't have the split between uh, people who go to church a lot and those who don't. Uh, having different voting patterns. That just, that just wasn't an issue back then. Um, yeah, I think there was a question here first. Yes. It seems like as you went through your, this era, yeah. it seems less like the voting patterns of the people changed than the, the parties changed. Yeah, is it less the people than the parties? You know, uh, the regions versus the parties. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of evidence that would, uh, would, would support that. You looked at... If, you look at progressive Republicans like uh, Theodore Roosevelt, they'd, they'd be much more in line with the Democratic Party, except when it comes to the issue of military and imperialism. So sometimes it's, you've got to look at an issue-by-issue issue basis. But in general, we could say certainly in, say, in an election like uh, 1904, uh, definitely, I mean, the Democrat was far more conservative than the Republican overall. Uh, what you had in, in the 50s, you basically had four groups. You had the conservative Democrats and the liberal Democrats, and the conservative Republicans and the liberal Republicans. You had something like the, called the conservative coalition, which was Democrats from the South and conservative Republicans that emerged in the late 40s to, to fight against um, Franklin Roosevelt. And that persisted uh, through the 1950s. So it was really sort of a, a four-way uh, divide. 
but uh, partly it was, um, it depends on the issues and a lot of the hot button cultural issues today, abortion, gun rights, uh, gay rights, these sort of, they weren't on the table at all. So they just didn't come into to play in those issues. But if we look at uh, women's suffrage, generally it was the progressive Republicans who were more in favor of, of that than the Democrats at the time. Uh, so yeah, you do have to look at individual issues. But it's, 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 it's one of the most interesting things about American political history, that you have had these, these switches of, 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 of parties and, uh, and of regions as well. Thanks. In the way back, yeah, the question is, how was uh, Frank, uh, Franklin Roosevelt able to create this New Deal coalition? Well, partly it was just the, the horrors of the Depression, the U.S. Uh, de uh, economic output declined by, what was it, 50% or so. I mean, it's just this massive drop, 30% unemployment. And so there was just real desperation in much of the country. And this more active approach that actually uh, was, was pro-labor but also pro-farmer. And the fact that he, he ignored the issue of race in the South. And it's something his wife was very concerned about. Uh, she did not like segregation and the disenfranchisement of blacks at all. But the view was that if you, if you upset the Southern whites, they're going to bolt out of the party, and then we can't hold this coalition together anymore. So the, the Democrats really uh, soft-pedaled that. And it, uh, certainly uh, up until 37, uh, from 32 to 37, the United States economy really did rebound. Uh, industrial production went way up, unemployment came down, and 37 it dropped down a bit, but that really helped him in that 36 election. And then in 1940 you had the threat of war, and often when you have this sort of looming threat of war, people will tend to vote for the leaders in power. If they're, if they're really worried about that, there's a, a certain tendency, perhaps. I mean, that, that, that's probably not a very professional explanation, but that's, that's, that's the best I can do right now. Uh, yes? How, was, how significant was Roosevelt's third term at the time? Uh, he was the first one to go beyond. Yeah, that's OK. Roosevelt having run for a third term, breaking the precedent set by George Washington himself. So there was a lot of uh, animosity towards him. A lot of the, the Republicans particularly thought he was sort of cheating, that he wasn't supposed to do that. And then especially the fourth term, and he was very ill in that uh, fourth election. He was not healthy at all. Of course, his infirmities were kept from the public. Most people had no idea that he couldn't walk. Uh, can you imagine that today? Uh, it's just unthinkable. But uh, yeah, they, they photographed him in such a way that uh, he could stand with braces, and people, people didn't know that he was paralyzed uh, from, uh, basically from the waist down, and he couldn't walk. Uh, but yeah, there was a, a lot of, uh, of uh, anger over, over that. I know there was another question in the front. Was there? Yes. We may have time for one more. Well, in the 1968 election, uh, was there any, were there any areas outside of the South that Wallace picked up a decent amount of support? Yeah, any areas in 1968, oh, absolutely. And I wish I had the county level uh, data to show you. Even in California, places like Kern County, Bakersfield, uh, some of the uh, San Joaquin Valley uh, foothills, I think he's up 15% in some of those areas. I'd have to check again. There were many parts of the uh, uh, parts of the of the West and the border states where he got some significant uh, amount of votes, and even in some of the industrial areas, he did pretty well. He actually had been uh, uh, he hadn't been he hadn't been considered an extremely conservative Democrat, uh, but when when uh, integration was really being pushed, then he uh, opted out. Uh, he actually had, had somewhat somewhat good relations with African Americans. Well, not good, but you know, okay relations. And he had a comment. Uh, he actually had lost an election, and he said, "I will not be out n-worded again. Uh, that I will, in other words, I will go strictly for white supremacy because he knew that there was so much anti-black sentiment among the whites that if he wanted to maintain that power base, he he had to go uh, with it. At least that's what I've read." Okay, are, are we, uh, is, the, is the time up? Do we have any more time? I think my watch isn't working. Okay, I'm sorry, but um, thank you for your questions. And again, we've had some very interesting uh, comments on the blog for the course. Uh, uh, we've been talking about places like Cincinnati uh, and its uh, distinctive voting patterns. And I'd uh, be very happy if other people would join in because 
I know in this uh, classroom as a whole, there's a lot of knowledge about this. And a lot of you know a lot more than I do about many of these issues. So take a look at it, and please feel free to join in. Thank you so much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.